Well, he said he would be back. I had a uh, teacher, an old Methodist teacher in a college I went two years ago, W.E. Cassell. And when he got very excited in the lectures, he would start to spit. It would just kind of come out like that. So only those who didn't know him and know the classes would sit in the front row. So I'm beginning to wonder if I kind of do the same at times. I don't. So those of you who are closer don't have to worry about that type of thing. And yes, he has returned. And I apologize because our machine is not working upstairs again. <laughs> so no problem. Go right ahead. Thank you. I'll just pause for a word of prayer, please. <clears throat> Father, we do stop in uh, this moment of this Lord's Day to, again, for, from our hearts, recognize your grace and your mercy, showering us with. Uh, tremendous blessings from on high, allowing us to meet as your children and to sing as we do hymns that uh, speak of things that are near and dear to our hearts, our uh, hope and strength here in this world, but also for the hope that lies beyond, the joy that we have within our hearts, and that which is just a, a tremendous blessing to us. And yet, Lord, as we looked around on this particular day, we saw the world around us filled with uh, the allurements of the world, involved in many supposed great causes to raise money for this or for that, to enjoy uh, the weather, the picnicking, the outside, and everything with not one single thought of the Creator who has given them all these things. And it grieves us, Lord, even as it grieves you. May, Lord, the burden for the loss continue to be upon our hearts. May, Father, you bring us opportunity to share these Gospels of John, uh, share our own personal testimony, uh, cause us to think once again our walk, our way of life, and the way that we express ourselves before the world around us, that we might show forth you in us. Thank you again for this time. As we open your word, may it be profitable to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. The citation reads, Specialist for Leslie H. Sabo, Jr., distinguished himself by conspicuous acts of gallantry and heroism above and beyond the call of duty at the cost of his own life while serving as a rifleman in Company B, 3rd Battalion, 506th Infantry, 101st Airborne Division in Saison, Cambodia, May the 10th of 1970. On that day, Specialist 4 Sabo and his platoon were conducting a reconnaissance patrol when they were ambushed from all sides by a large company of the enemy force. Without hesitation, Specialist 4 Sabo charged the enemy position, killing several enemy soldiers, and immediately thereafter he assaulted an enemy flanking force, successfully drawing their fire away from the friendly soldiers and ultimately forcing the enemy to retreat. In order to resupply ammunition, he sprinted across the open field to a wounded comrade. As he began to reload, an enemy grenade landed nearby. Specialist Force Evo picked it up and threw it and shielded his comrade with his own body, thus absorbing the brunt of the blast, saving his comrade's life. Seriously wounded by the blast, Specialist Force Evo nonetheless retained the initiative and the single-handedly charged the enemy bunker that had inflicted the severe damage on the platoon, receiving several serious wounds from automatic weapons fire in the process. Now mortally injured, he crawled towards the enemy emplacement and, when in position, threw a grenade into the bunker. The resulting explosion silenced the enemy fire, but also ended Specialist 4 Sebo's life. His indomitable courage in complete disregard for his own safety, saved the lives of many in his platoon. Specialist for Sebo's extraordinary heroism and selflessness, above and beyond the call of duty at the cost of his own life, and in the keeping with the highest traditions of the military service, and reflect the great credit to himself, Company B, 3rd Platoon, 506th Infantry, 101st Airborne, and the United States Army. 
Specialist for Leslie H. Sebo Jr. was awarded on May the 16th, 2012, the Congressional Medal of Honor. What kind of courage does it take to engage an enemy of such magnitude, knowing full well that it will cost you your life? I pray that would never happen to any of us. Although in the world situation where war is ever present in various forms, it may seem that it may come upon some of us at some time. Yet in the matter of living courageously on our part as what we would refer to as civilian life, especially for someone who has put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we recognize that the enemy doesn't come in forms with guns and knives, with missiles and bombs, but he comes craftily. And we know that even in this situation, cowardice will bring defeat. But it's quite another thing with the enemy being unseen and using weapons that are most skillfully diabolical. We need extreme courage so cowardice does not come upon us. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18 is a text I'll read tonight. It's a very familiar passage of the Christian armor. The Apostle Paul wrapping up this particular epistle with these words that I'm sure you've heard before. Ephesians 6, beginning at verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The passage of the Christian armor is often used for vacation Bible school programs. The children will be dressed with uh, uh, cardboard, uh, colored paper, uh, armor, uh, helmet of some form, an old garbage can lid for a shield, uh, cardboard, a sword, and, and uh, the such. They're very happy to wear it. And yet I'm afraid that we tend, as Christians, to think of Christian warfare like this rather than what it really is. We tend to perceive our Christian warfare to be involved in the little sword and the little shield and, and uh, make of it much lighter than it actually is. Obviously, we're not talking about combat forces from North Korea or ISIS coming down. But we're talking about Satan, the accuser, the devil, the deceiver, the father of lies, the wicked one, and so forth. This is the reason why Paul writes the Ephesian church and why it's been preserved for us today. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He says, for the reason is we don't wrestle against the flesh and blood, for in that case we would have the ability, or some of us. But he says, in the instance of this particular spiritual battle that we're all engaged in, the only power that we have for any kind of victory in any fashion whatsoever comes from the Lord. He refers to those areas of attack as principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, this age, the spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Who's ever stood against them by themselves? Who's ever fought such a battle in the flesh and never walked away, except we've been dragged through the mud? Brethren, every single day we must begin by putting on the strength of the Lord. Mom would always say, well, you have breakfast, and that's the 
first meal of the day and you've got to have a great breakfast in order to handle the entire day with a good meal in your belly doesn't help us to face the spiritual battles of life. Just attending a Sunday service or a couple Sunday services won't prepare you for the battle of pornography on the computer on Monday. Going up and pulling up your Bible and reading some scripture or taking an occasional prayer won't enable you to fight against the fit of rage that you're going to come across on the highway or in the office. Singing, playing an instrument, teaching a Sunday school class, giving a generous amount to church, going on a mission trip, pastoring a church. None of these things in of themselves prepare us for the battle that's going on around us unless it's done in the Lord and in his strength. It's key to keep those things in mind. I thought a couple of scenarios that may make application of this. There's a young man, a shepherd boy, late teens, facing a seasoned warrior, nine foot nine inches in height. The spear he chucked had a 15 pound head. You know the story of the famed David, David and Goliath battle, which really wasn't a battle at all. Just before David sunk the stone into his head, he says these words, Thou comest to me with sword and spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou defiled. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the, ho of the host of the Philistine this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beast of the earth, and all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David's courage came not from knowing about the Lord, but from knowing the Lord. And there's a difference, a tremendous difference in our own life. You may know some great politician, some former great person, a general or whatever in life. You may know them, but you really don't know them as they are. You can know more about the President of the United States than you would really want to, but you really don't know him. So even this evening, you may know a lot about God, but knowing him in such a way that he has come to strengthen you for each part of life and the battles that exist is truly the challenge. I read these words of David. They are bold words, but they're not based upon his ability to sling a stone. And I'm sure every shepherd boy who was even watching over any size flock knew how to sling a stone. But they were based upon his personal relationship with Jehovah God. And knowing that, that boy did what an army of trained soldiers were afraid to do. For they were trained to fight in the arm of the flesh, and David was trained only to recognize the things that were obvious to him because he was strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. There will be times when you and I are faced with tremendous decisions, choices, dangers, enormous enemies. And the enemy will be obvious and you'll be standing there and he'll be in front of you thundering out threats, screaming in your face so we're all around are quaking at the possibility of what's going to take place. It's cancer. The doctor says, you're fired, clean out your desk right away. I'm filing for divorce. The phone rings in the middle of the night and it's your brother or sister. Dad's had a heart attack and he's in bad shape. The enemy comes in all fashions, in all forms, and those attacks come in a fashion that we sometimes just don't know what to do. The coward runs, hides, does whatever he can to avoid thinking about the enemy, to shut him off, to close off that particular door. Maybe a drink, maybe a pill, 
maybe just to literally run away from the situation, keep it far away geographically as you can. But the Christian can and should stand and face the enemy in the strength of the Lord, knowing whatever the outcome is, God will be victorious. And I say that with the understanding that it always doesn't mean that it comes out in a fashion that we expect. The cancer isn't always cured. Dad won't always be recovered from his heart attack. The divorce, well, maybe there will be no reconciliation. That job, you lost one, but maybe it doesn't mean you'll get one, a new one, and a better one sooner than you thought. But it does mean that you can still live a victorious Christian life through his strength and through the power of his might as you go face to face with Goliaths of all kinds. And you've experienced that. You've walked down those roads. You've heard the shouts. And there are times when we've stepped away from that which is obvious in the strength of the Lord and we feared. We've quivered. We felt like, oh, this is the end. But in fact, he's been there to strengthen us. Another scenario. After a number of years, ups and downs, some serious issues in the family, this young man works his way into a position of great authority. Great job, has benefits, chance to advance, when all of a sudden he is seductively approached by the boss's wife. And she wants something more from this good-looking young man than having him take out the garbage each day. By now you know it's the Old Testament character of Joseph. The character who has been standing strong in the Lord against all types of odds for a long time and now does so in front of the boss's wife. Reading from the text, he says, But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. And this is key. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The, 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 the scenario outlines really shows a, a quality of a young man that's far beyond his age. Potiphar's wife represents an enemy unlike the frontal assault of Goliath. She's sly and slick, sneaking around to attack and appealing the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, the pride of life, not the shouts and the screams of, of the enemy just blasting your face on, but subtly. The bait was offered with one physical encounter, and that could be uh, maybe some promotion. You go with me, and I'll see that you even have more than you ever thought you could have ever had. Job security, all in secret reading of the character of Mrs. Potiphar here, I doubt that this was the first household servant that she approached. I kind of think she was a woman of opportunity when it came to young men. If you read about Egyptian marriages, it seems like these type of relationships were done not at all for love, but for much more than that. How often has Satan dropped the bait before us? Not necessarily in the same fashion of a sexual nature, although that is probably the most obvious today. But with these thoughts, nobody's watching. Nobody's going to know. The parameters are there. You know, Nobody knows. Nobody sees. Used to be everything was done in darkness for the criminal aspect, but not anymore today. It's just this once, one time only. How often has that been whispered by the enemy? just once. It'll satisfy. That'll be enough and then you can go on. Take it. Nobody will miss it. There's so many of them. That's so bad. Why everybody else enjoy it. After all, everyone else is doing the same thing. 
and on and on. The attacks are subtle, but they are just as entrapping and just as crushing to the spirit of man as the attack of Goliath as he stood there and blasted in those various similar blasts do. But Joseph responds with, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? To him it was obvious. He puts on these glasses and he sees past all of the rhetoric, he sees past all of the fineries that could possibly be that other men or other positions would have fallen to, and he says, it's clear to me that this is a matter of right and wrong, good and evil, black and white. I can't sin against God in doing this. For Joseph knew God, not knew about him. Joseph knew that to fall to the enticements of Mrs. Potiphar was nothing more than a sin against the God that he served. There's no gray area. His courage came when he was called upon to compromise his beliefs, and he saw as that a great wickedness to do otherwise. Not in a matter of grayness. Being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might enabled Joseph to clearly define what was wrong and to run from it. I think your scriptures are full of examples of men and women who had the same. Not always in their life. There were times when, when they, they fell, times when they stumbled. You go through Hebrews 11 and read of the men and women of faith. Uh, names that are mentioned that we're familiar with and unnamed people that are there because of this faith relationship they had that enabled them to do great things because of the strength they found in God and in the power of his might. I think they are found in these characters because by God's grace they were enabled to do those very same things. They were strengthened, they were lifted up. They said, my walk with my Lord enables me to do this. And then if you go back and you look at the rest of that chapter, it says, being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might is done by doing what? What is the rest of the verses that we read there? Put it in the whole armor of God. You know. Adapting those principles, putting on every single day the, the armor of God, enables me to say, this is the God that I know and love, who's redeemed me. And not just, he saved me now that I can go and live as I please and do as I want, but I have a responsibility to put this on daily, and as I do that, I'm equipped for a battle that otherwise I'm naked. Otherwise I'm, I'm, I'm without anything. On the mission field, Churches are planted, vacation and Bible school programs are run, couples marry, children are born. And you know what? They face the same struggles as we do. Did you believe that? In a third world country, men and women and boys and girls, families and churches face the same thing that we do. It's amazing. Because sometimes we put ourselves so distant from the mission field, the mission world, that it doesn't appear like that. I don't know what struggles you're facing today, what attacks, what enemies. Some may seem minor, some may seem very serious situations that need immediate attention, gaining victory over some attacking sin, the feeling of that you're living without a purpose, fearful of the future, not sure what to do. We're always asking for prayer, that means there's some misdirection, confusion, you know, just not sure what to do. The answer is the same, being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Knowing him, not about him, but knowing him. Can you pray for the members of the two churches in Eureka, Chile? The viewers and the Haras? What happened to Janeth within this last month? Janeth Hara. Stomach cancer. Stomach cancer you know. And so we think of that, and, and I'm as guilty of it as anybody else, 
We think of that, we pray for Jan for healing and so forth, but like in our own particular families and situation, who else is involved? There's a husband, there's, there's children, there's a church, there's other family members, saved and unsaved. Sometimes you will come along and will say, Lord, bless the missionaries. You know, it's kind of like taking a handful of fairy dust and sprinkling it all over the missionary. Bless them, you know. But they're just like we are. And the people of those churches are just like the people in our churches. And so as we think of that which is necessary for us to live our day, it's the same for them to live in their day and to minister in the same fashion. Jim and Melody Buer have a daughter graduating from Bob Jones. This finds out that she's on her way to China to teach uh, in the Bob Jones school over there. How do you think that makes mom and dad feel? You know, tremendous responsibility, the privilege of seeing their daughter go off and do that, but boy, that's separated some distance. You know, how do we pray for that? You know, another son still in school, two other children, and and and. Who's going to take the church when they come on furlough? Other things to, to think about that. I'm thinking of Stephen and Lydia Choi in Cambodia. They haven't been in the States for quite a few years. Really haven't spent on furlough. They're the only missionary couple there working. How do you think it is when you're a Korean, you, you're, you've mastered Chinese, but you're in Cambodia? I think it's lonely at times. I think it's difficult. You read their prayer letters and they say, well, we build a new church in a better area of Phnom Penh, and yet the people look at us like we have got three eyes. You, know? you, you people, you, you Christians are just, you know, nothing. We don't have anything to do with you. And you can read in between the lines of the burdens in their hearts to say, Lord, we've been working, we've been praying, we've been doing all the, you know, the can and the power of our might. We need to lean on the Lord, but... Um, we need to pray with understanding as we read those things and say, this couple needs encouragement. This couple needs to see not only people being saved, but that their hearts are filled and satisfied with the various things that are there. I mentioned this morning the Dr. and Mrs. Hawks as they started out there in Nairobi, the Bible College, and just a stone's throw away from the college property is the Lumumba Institute of uh, Political Science. Communist organization right there next to them. And there are no uh, supporting uh, bodies. There is no organization to say, okay, Bible College, you're going to just show the way. And we had the slide of Dr. Hawk's own words. He says, you know, this is a spiritual battle. We need to pray to see that this institute closes down and with 40 days after it opened, the government came and closed the Lumumba Institute down. The various things that are there in battle. I read of our records and the Korean War saw great tragedy, but before that, we had missionaries that were taken captive in Korea by the Japanese and imprisoned. And I don't know how that was felt, but you know, a tremendous uh, feeling of helplessness, um, the various spiritual struggles that are ongoing. I say these things because with all that we face as individuals and as families and as a congregation to battle with, we have a responsibility to reach out to those others of the household of faith, missionaries, the churches that they're involved in, uh, you read the prayer letters that are there, you know, eight years in India, we put out the, the Pray, Send, Go uh, paper, or seven years in India, yeah, Pray, Send, Go paper, and uh, I just got a report from the church, the St. Thomas Evangelical Church of India, and he says, we uh, are, are under tremendous pressure because we can't find the paperwork that says that, that Miss Lee, who, uh, different, Miss um, Lee, who was there serving for since 1929, had given that property to the independent board. We don't have the documentation for it. And we've expended so much money to keep it from the hands of this absconding bishop who wanted to take the property and for his own that you know, we just don't know what to do. You know. um, will it end? Is that the end of it? So all of these things are 
conflicting constantly, what do we do? It's not a spiritual battle for us to entertain unless we put on the armor of God. We can't do it by the flesh. I can write letters. I can say, oh, we'll give this or we can supply this. or That's not the answer. The answer is as we do it individually for those struggles that we have, that our families have, that churches have, we've got to, we've got to be involved in this matter. Talked about the, the Supreme Court's responsibilities uh, coming up uh, with, with the, the principles of what is really, what is marriage? You know, how it affects us, how it affects pastors, but how it affects the whole outreach of Christianity. You know, we say, oh, man, that's terrible. You know, it's just a terrible thing. It takes more than that. We can't just sit there and say that. We've got to be able to say, Lord, you can give victories here if that's your will. But nonetheless, in the arm of God's strength, by his power, by his might, can these things be accomplished. I challenge you afresh to pray. I sincerely do. Uh, it seems sometimes to be um, just repetitive, you know, but it's not. Uh, it is that core base that we have in our link with our Heavenly Father that allows us to feel the confidence of His grace and His mercy in a day when there's nothing else to be leaned upon. To be able to recognize that He it, it is in it. The hymns that we sing speak of great victories, and, and we're going to close with one uh, in a minute here, but uh, this, is, this is of tremendous responsibility. We have nothing else. We have nothing else. Shall we pray? Father, there is a, we recognize more and more each day, a tremendous war that's ongoing around us. Those things that we've held near and dear in this country have slipped away for one reason or another. The pillars of what we have always felt were guarantees of our country are crumbling, foundations breaking apart, churches losing interest in being uh, beacons of light and truth in the very day in which we live, uh, not caring about evangelism, not caring about reaching out to others. Lord, burden our hearts with something more in saying that this is so bad and this is so terrible but bring us to our knees and say, Father, you are the victory. You, Lord, in your strength and by your might, there is victory. Irrespective of what we perceive as the right outcome, your name is going to be glorified. Father, minister through us in prayer. Cause us not to frittle away our, our hours in worthless, meaningless endeavors that have no eternal value whatsoever. But may, Father, we find the strength as we put on the armor and then understand with great clarity who you are that we will know when the questions come, what's right and wrong, where we should go, what is the direction that you are leading us in, what we should say and how it should be accomplished, that with confidence we can go forward. We look for nothing else, Lord, but than, than, your, than your countenance upon us. Uh, bless these seeds of truth from your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let's close 734. Oh, yeah, I'm beating better. You got another one. Okay. Yeah. I was going to.